Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Review podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I hope you're having a fabulous Tuesday, that your week is off to a great start, that you had a good weekend. I actually got to hang out with my aunt on Sunday, my mom's sister. She's one of my favorite people to hang out with. I've probably mentioned that I lived with her for a time um, in Plano, Texas, and that was so much fun. She is just a kick to hang out with. So Definitely had a good Sunday for my weekend. Hope you had something enjoyable as well. And like I said, hope your week is off to a good start. Going to be talking to another author today. As I mentioned at the end of the last episode, I am speaking today with author Richard Paolinelli. And again, I'm hoping I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right because I don't think I uh, no I I forgot to ask him during the interview if that is how you pronounce his last name. And many of you maybe know the Aragon series. That's Christopher Paolini. He is from Montana, so cool. Um, So when I see the P-A-O-L in my head, I I just think Paolini. And that is not his name. There are more letters in his name. So I think it's Paolinelli. But Richard, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, I apologize. Please feel free to correct me. The book is called Galen's Way. And... It's something of an answer to, well, the concept is something of an answer to Disney's version of Star Wars, as Richard's going to discuss in the interview. You're going to see why my first thought was Star Wars when I got the book in the mail and read the back. Here is the description on the back of Galen's Way. Did I say it's called Galen's Way? Oy, it's uh, Galen's Way, and it's a Star Quest Fourth Age adventure. It's the first book in the fourth age adventures of StarQuest, and you're going to learn more about that in the interview. Millions of years in the future, humanity has been driven out of the Milky Way and now calls the Andromeda Galaxy home. Lost in their murky past are the tales of great knights that held the line against the invasion of a dark force until the rest of humanity could escape their doom. The last and greatest of these knights was Galen Underwood. Long after that heroic stand, a mercenary by the name of Galen Dwyn has been hired to rescue a kidnapped princess. Enticed by a healthy down payment and a chance to settle an old score, Galen accepts the job, only to find out it's a lot more than he bargained for. Soon, Galen finds himself weaving and dodging through a web of political intrigue as the very forces that chase him have set in motion plans that will throw the Galactic Alliance into civil war. To his surprise, he also finds that the rescued princess might not be the might not, excuse me might not be quite the spoiled brat he rescued from the clutches of her keeper. Accompanied by the princess, his former mentor, and a snarky AI, Galen sets out to find a way to outsmart entire kingdoms, keep the princess alive, and avert the deaths of millions. Of course, he'll also learn the reasons behind his namesake's chosen path, as he realizes that the only way to win is to join. Galen's Way. And that is the description of Galen's Way. And maybe you had a couple of Star Wars vibes in there as well. We're going to find out more about those vibes, um, about why this has a little bit of a Star Wars feel to it. So why don't we go ahead and turn to the interview because Richard will be able to explain that so much better than I can. And I think it's a pretty cool story as to how this, well, this series, but also other series have gotten started. More on that. Hi, Richard. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks for having me on. 
Thank you for being here. I am excited to talk about your new book. Is it Galen or Gallen? It's Galen. Okay, that's the way I was pronouncing it. So we're going to talk about Galen's Way, but before we get to the book, um, if you could share a little bit about yourself, that would be wonderful. Well, I I have been writing in one form or another professionally since 1983. Um, I started off in fiction, um, I did some freelance work, and then wound up getting offered a, a newspaper job and, and spent about 20 years in the Southwest writing for different newspapers. And when I got tired of that, uh, I decided to uh, retire and get back into fiction writing. And that was about 2013 when I started, and I, I got my first book published in 2015. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, so, as I said, the book is called Galen's Way. It's the first book in a new series, correct? Correct. Okay. So, can you give the premise of the first book and, and maybe a little bit of the series? Well, I probably should start with the series because this was created by John C. Wright, who is a very well-known, very uh, very great science fiction fantasy author. And um, a, a few years ago, he had decided he wasn't happy with Disney's version of Star Wars and wanted to kind of create his own Star Wars type universe and sat down and, and started working it out. And then also decided he wanted to invite other authors to basically come in and, and play in his sandbox. And uh, he was on my podcast, I'd say about two years ago, and was talking about it. Uh, and and kind of laying it down the groundworks of of the series, and it happened to mesh with a space opera idea I had, so I I kind of jumped into this. And basically, the premise is that uh, far into our future, the human race is going to be basically scooped up and transplanted from the Milky Way galaxy to the Andromeda galaxy. And this is ahead of a what John called a dark force that is coming in and basically destroying life wherever it finds it. It's, it's you know, wiping out stars, you know, which obviously takes out the planets and you don't have life anymore. So a, a race comes in and moves us out before this thing can get to us, and we're transplanted to Andromeda. And when his, it's called the Star Quest uh, series, and when we pick up the human race in Star Quest, it has been millions of years since that has happened, and the human race has forgotten where it came from. And we're, we're kind of gradually remembering, and we're starting to uh, figure out what's going on. He, he created 12 ages in his StarQuest universe, and he writes in the 12th, which is in itself hundreds of thousands of years beyond the point we were transplanted. I picked up the fourth age merely because by that point in time, the human race still doesn't know that it's got neighbors in the Andromeda galaxy. So we're, we're still thinking we're the only ones out there. Um, so when we, we get into fourth age, uh, we have an alliance of planets in this little, this little corner of the Andromeda galaxy where the human race is. But the alliance is coming under attack from... Uh, a small group of people who want to turn it into an empire. And uh, to do so, they, they kind of have to trigger a political crisis. And by by this, they, they kidnap the daughters of certain leaders and then try to pin it on the chancellor of the alliance so that this would trigger these, these planets into uh, basically overthrowing the the chancellor and opening the door for this empire that wants to come in and kind of take things over. Um, so we pick up the story with Galen being hired to go find these kidnapped princesses. And it's a setup so that when he gets there, there's going to, to there's going to be an explosion and he's going to be blamed. And then it's going to be pinned on the chancellor as if the chancellor hired him when that wasn't what happened. So Galen now, he, he manages to make the rescue and survive the trap, but now he's got himself in the middle of this political intrigue and pretty much everybody in the galaxy thinking he's the bad guy and they want him dead. So now he's got to figure out how to keep them alive 
and stop this empire from uh, from being born. And we just kind of pick up from there, and we learn a lot about Galen's past, and we see Galen kind of change from this, uh, you know, gun for hire mercenary to the kind of a, a character, a kind of a person who would, as as we do in our in our promo for this, uh, stand alone against an empire. So that that's kind of. The, the basic premise for what we're doing uh, for my part of it, the fourth age, it's going to follow Galen as uh, as he continues to kind of go at it with these people who want to bring this empire in. And so how then is there some kind of like database where everybody <laughs> how do you keep things in the universe kind of straight and um, and in the same not voice, but how do you keep track of details and things with other authors? Well, well, fortunately, John put together this Bible that he will he will send to an author who expresses interest. It's 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 a small Bible. It's only a hundred pages, and you you basically have to read this whole thing, study it, and and understand that you know he's got every age, what happens in every age, basically laid out, and you have to work within that that framework uh and make sure that you don't come up with something that's going to interfere with what's coming later and and fortunately john is married to a, a woman who is a, a very accomplished author and an amazing editor in her own right and she we kind of call her star quest central so when we get done with our manuscript we send it to her and uh, her name is jaji lamplighter and she goes through and she'll, you know, she'll find if there's anything that's in conflict. Uh, that we found one thing in mind that we had to change, but it was it was a minor change. And she also puts in some notes. You know, we're going to be doing this in twelve. Keep this in mind as you go forward, type thing. So we we do have a we have kind of a database, and then we have kind of our our um, I don't want to say gatekeeper because I hate gatekeeping. We have we have one person whose job it is is to kind of make sure. We all stay it's kind of a continuity person on a film. Uh, she kind of makes sure that we're all on the same track. And then the authors, uh, we're, we're talking to each other. Uh, one of the authors is going to work in Seventh Age. He and I worked out some things that I put in Galen's way that are going to help him in his Seventh Age story. So it, it's it's kind of a big collaboration. And so far, I think we're we're doing really good on keeping everything in line. Um, it, it's going to be a challenge to continue doing so, but I, I think with the group we have, I think we're going to be able to do it. We're going to go ahead and take the first break of the podcast, and during that break, I'm going to continue pondering what I've been pondering since this conversation, and that is whether or not I think the job of StarQuest Central is the most awesome job ever or the hardest job ever, or maybe both. Just the thought of... Well, getting to know all those details is awesome, but also trying to keep track of all those details from all the different ages and the different authors and just the 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 arc and the overall picture. Whew, that is uh, that's an accomplishment. So, good job, Star Star Quest Central. Let's go ahead and take that break. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Hey, it's Sarah here to tell you about the Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all in one dryer brush. I just took this traveling with me and it is amazing in that it is a three in one tool. I didn't have to pack extra equipment with me just for my hair on this trip. It has a hair dryer, it is a volumizer, it is a detangler. It can do all of these things in one step. The large oval brush creates glam waves. The bristles painlessly remove knots as you dry and style. It uses ionic technology to create a frizz-free look effortlessly. Speaking of that frizz-free look, there are three heat settings plus a cool setting that will lock in your look for effortless looking hairstyles. It's got a bonus volumizing attachment included that gives you added lift at the roots and the removable attachments make storage at home or away super easy. Like I said, I just traveled with it and it was so easy and so convenient. If you would like your very own Infinity Pro by Conair with the Knot Doctor all-in-one dryer brush, simply go to conair.com and search dryer brush. Again, that is conair, C-O-N-A 
AIR.com and search Dryer Brush. TSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Richard Paolinelli about his book, Galen's Way, which is the first in a series about the fourth age of StarQuest. And we were talking about keeping track of StarQuest before the break. Still haven't come to a good conclusion, but that's what we were talking about, was keeping track of all those details before the break, just as a reminder. So let's now return to that interview with Richard. That's really amazing, and also um, it could potentially be very confusing, but that's I think it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, that's kind of John's job, is to make sure that there is no confusion, make sure it all, you know, fits to what John's doing. And, and John has, he's already written four books that are going to be coming out, I think, at the beginning of 2022. I think he wants to, to start them then. And uh, he he actually had to stop and go back because he had noticed that there was a problem that wasn't lining up. So, you know, he's the guy who created this, and he's having to do this. And we're constantly doing it. Um, I'm actually going to do some pre-migration stories that are connected. And if you read the, the prologue to Galen's Way, I kind of set the stage. Um, you're introduced to another Galen, a Galen Underwood. Who was the was the leader of the Rangers who stood against the Stark Force while the evacuation was going on, and we find out how he's connected to Galen Dwin, who is the Galen in Galen's way. So, um, you know, it, it it's it like I said, it could be confusing, and that's going to be our challenge is to make sure that it all flows together and it all connects. But I've seen outlines, and I've seen I know what I'm doing, I know what John's done. I've talked to some of the others. I I really think we're going to be able to get this to where it's a nice, one solid flowing universe, um, as opposed to what we see with some of the other IPs where people start throwing stuff in that just don't match up with what was originally done, and then everybody starts, you know, getting onto it. Um, I I think we're going to be able to avoid that. Very cool. You mentioned that you had a an idea for a space opera that that would fit with this series. So, what was your initial mm-hmm. inspiration for this particular story? You know, my my initial idea was basically, uh, you know, the, the princess and the pirate was the working title I had just to have something for it, and it was it was basically a a mercenary type, um, kind of a Han Solo without, yeah, you know, maybe a little bit more rougher, a little bit more um, meaner. If, if you will, um, and he gets himself into a situation where he's hired to rescue a princess, then things just aren't what they seem to be once he gets to her, and it would he would he would not fulfill his contract, but he would help her instead, and that you know that was the basic concept I had, and then when John and I were talking, he's laying out what he's doing. You know, the, the light bulb went off. It's like, hey, here's the perfect time to do this and make it a part of this this whole universe here. And it's it you know, since getting involved with StarQuest, the the project has, has obviously expanded. Yeah, you know, my original idea has already has expanded. Galen is gonna be so much more than what I originally intended for that character to do. But I you know, it, it the way it's working out, the way it's mapped out, uh, I, I think we've got some. I think I've got some great character arcs going, um, especially with one character who is not even a human being. It's the AI on his ship. Her her story arc is going to be 
I think it's going to be pretty amazing. I'm, I'm waiting to see what it reveals this response is going to be. Fun. Can you talk a little bit more than about Galen and what about his character you think is going to resonate with readers? Well, with Galen, he he was found wandering um, the streets as an orphan, and he had actually, at the tender age of six, had already organized all the other street orphans into um, a, a unit that could go out, and I mean, they were basically stealing food and whatever they needed, but he was he had organized them to where they were being fed, they were being clothed, even though society, the society they lived in had abandoned them and didn't care, he had managed at that young age to organize them so that they could survive. And he eventually gets kind of gathered up by the local authorities and handed over to the military for uh, the human race in Andromeda, uh, the Badawan. And he's kind of forced to, to join that organization. And that's where he meets his mentor. And uh, Lear sees in him uh, kind of a code uh, that, that you, know, you don't teach. This is something that's just in a, in a person or it isn't. And Lear is a historian and, and, knows, and has written about and, and studied the old galactic knights of the old... Uh, Milky Way galaxy, and so he he kind of steers Galen along as best he can toward that path, uh, but eventually Galen gets tired of being in this military service, and and uh, you know we we find out that he was not well treated as he went through anyway, and so he decides that one day he's had enough. He just walks out, grabs a ship, and takes off, which as you could imagine, a military organization would not be happy with. So they send men and ships after him, and all they are getting back are bodies and broken ships, and they finally figure out, okay, this is the guy we need to just leave alone. And they they, they abandon their pursuit of him, and Galen just becomes kind of a, a, a mercenary, a gun for hire. Uh, he'll smuggle what he needs to. If you pay him, um, you know, he'll do, he'll do a job if, if it pays. But at the same time, there's still that core of honor in him that we, we see um, you know, we, he's not just this mindless killer. He 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 will do what he needs to do, but he's not just going to wipe out people just because they happen to be nearby. And there's a, there's an incident in an alley where he's ambushed by three men and this one young girl who has no business being involved in something like this. And he he dispatches the three men, but then he spares her and and basically tells her just go back home and get away from this and save herself. So. You know, we will see these little parts of him before he even encounters the princess. And after after the rescue, you're going to see you're going to see him kind of grow a little bit. You're going to see him kind of change the way he approaches things. He's no longer this lone wolf. He actually finds a cause, a person to to fight for, and that's the you know that's that's part of his story arc. And it will continue because he'll eventually go from just being this this smuggler to a leader of uh, this entire secular area of the galaxy where they, they're going to have to fight against this empire that is trying to muscle in. And so he, he goes from just being, a, I'm just in it for myself, to I'm in it for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a little bit of the hero's journey in there, a little bit of yeah. kind of... Uh, the the rebel now with a cause. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, and and I think readers are going to identify that. I think readers like those kind of stories and like those kind of characters. They're not perfect. Uh, they have their they have their flaws. They have their their ghosts in the past. They've done some bad things, but when it comes right down to it, they they are going to step up and they're going to, you know, be more than what they were before, and and be someone that, that people would look up to and would follow. Time for the second break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about research and the types of research that you need to do to write a space opera. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. 
There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. podcast and my interview with author Richard Paolinelli. Let's get back to that interview. Did you do any particular types of research for the book or the series? Um, a lot of it was was more, you know, the layout of the Andromeda Galaxy, uh, some some research on ships and and what you could get away with. I mean, we're talking advanced technology. I didn't want to just throw stuff in there and just say, you know, it, it works this way because I, I wanted to have some believability where, yeah, a ship could go that fast, a ship could do this. Uh, you could go from this star system to this star system in, in a certain amount of time. Um, but, you know, other than that, not really. Um, you know, I've read so much of the space author genre. I've written a lot. I just really kind of, I guess the one thing I had in mind was this is this is going to be my Star Wars-like um, effort. And so I, I went into it thinking, what would I have wanted to have seen happen to Star Wars, say, after uh, the Return of the Jedi? Instead of what actually was done, you know, there, there were things I would have done differently. Well, here's my chance. Here's how I want to do it. And just kind of worked it into uh, what John had laid down and made sure it would tie in with that. Mm -hmm. And because you're working with John and with other authors, there is uh, a world already. So how much world mm -hmm. build do you actually get to do within your parts of the story? Well, John did have, um, he had certain planets identified and which races would be on those planets. So um, the one planet where the Alliance is based on was set by John. The rest of the planets in that area hadn't been developed yet. So with, with world building, I did, I was able to create some planets. Um, we have, you know, some of the, the, the types of ships. We have the the kind of the government setup I was able to do because by the time we get to 12, everything is completely different. So everything I, I knew everything I was going to do in fourth would not survive beyond the fourth age. So I had that freedom to where I could, I could kind of put stuff in as long as by the time I'm done in fourth age, I make it clear that this is all gone and no longer applies. So I was able to do the alliance. I could set up the alliance because I knew the alliance was not going to survive at the end of the fourth. Um, this empire I built, same story. It's not going to survive at the end of the fourth. But I could build up how it came to be. I could build up how the alliance was run. Uh, we had a chancellor who was the head. Each planet had a senator and sent to the Senate. The Senate could replace the chancellor if it wanted. So I was able to do those kind of things. Um, the military arm, the, the, the Badawan, is something that will also not survive the end of the fourth. So I was able to build up this military where um, they, they were good at being the peacekeepers for that area, but they also had the political issues that, that they could uh, be handicapped by. So 
you know, I was building, I was building that, and I'm still kind of building it a little bit because I'm going to be adding some things in the sequel, as far as some other areas just outside of where the alliance's reach is. So I'm, I'm kind of building as I go, um, and I can do it that way because I don't have to worry about what is going to be going on beyond fourth because all this is going to be torn down. So it's kind of like you, you build up a, um, a sandcastle on the, on the beach. You know, in about an hour, the, the surf's coming in and taking it out. So you you don't have to worry about making sure everybody's going to think, oh, yeah, that would be that would be exactly how it should be, because it's just not going to matter. So. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes it a little easier <laughs> than trying to. Yeah it's, a, it's a, yeah, it's a lot easier to build this world because I know it, it's not going to last very long. So I can... I can kind of, I can kind of have the freedom to do what I want without having to worry about really messing things up later. Yeah. And how about characters? Do you like to do a lot of character development before you start writing, or do your characters tend to evolve more as you're writing? Um, I, they probably evolve more during writing. Uh, I have a basic idea of, of what the character looks like, what their motivations are, what they're going to be doing, what I want them to do. And as I'm writing it, I find I, I discover these little things about them as I go. Um, there's there's a, a scene when uh, Galen and Rhea are in hiding on the on this little island, and he's got a, a small little hideout there, and there's this sculpting device that he actually uses. And for him, it's a practical thing uh, that he it helps him focus on details. So that because he uses this this carving device to replicate what he's thinking of in his head, for him it's a practical thing. But it it you know it's he's basically creating art. So he's an artist at heart, even though he doesn't really realize that until Rhea kind of points it out. You know, it's it's that's something that I had not put into that character at the beginning. That's one of those little things that pop up. Um, you know, Rhea, I was the same way. I really didn't have a set idea of, of the type of person she was going to be, and she really grows, especially toward the end, when she forfeits um, being perfectly safe to to leave this safe hole that, that Galen has left her in where no one would find her, and she comes out to come to his aid and to, to rally the planets against the, the people behind this empire. Okay, thank you. Um, do you include any sort of autobiographical elements in your writing? Yeah, I I do that with every every character, every book. Um, you know, sometimes it's very subtle. Um, sometimes it's not so subtle. In, in Galen's, I'm trying to think if there's anything... Um, no, nothing that comes to mind immediately. The, the only example of it in my writing I could think of was in another book, and that was Reservations. And the main character is uh, at a meeting. It's supposed to be a breakfast meeting, and he orders, I think it was toast and some fruit. And people are, like, getting on to him. That's not much of a breakfast. He's like, I don't I don't eat early in the morning. I kind of sneak up on my food as the day goes. And that's me. You know, I, I think my first meal of the day will be about 12 o'clock. Because I just, you know, food and I, right off the bat, no, forget it. And I put that in uh, to that character. So, you know, I know I know I do it with every character. There's a little bit of me in every character. And sometimes it doesn't take you too long to look to find it. Um, but, yeah, I, I, there are. I just, right now, I just can't think of anything I did for Gaelic, just off, offhand. Mm-hmm. How many books do you have planned for the series, or do you have an arc, and it will just take the number of books that it takes? Do you, do you have an idea of that? <laughs> well, I, I have a basic arc, and right now in my head, I have, I want to say, six for Fourth Age, and maybe six more for the pre-migration part. So right now, about a dozen. I know what the last book is going to be in in the fourth age because, um, and it's not. In, well, I know I don't want to do spoilers, so I know what the last book is going to be. So when 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 I write that, I'll be done with fourth. Um, but right now, it's just how many books in between 
Galen's way on that last book. I right now I don't know. I know I can probably get at least six and and maybe two more on top of that before I be done with it. Mhm. And can you say anything about the next book without giving too much away about this one? Um well, obviously, the, the elements of the empire aren't quite through. So uh, there, there will be more interaction between uh, Galen and Rhea and, and the people behind the, the empire. Uh, it won't go so well for the good, for the good guys in the next book. Mm-hmm. Um, the third book is when they, they kind of turn things around. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I would be giving away so many spoilers if I tried to even go into what the second book is going to be. Uh, all, all I will say is the second book is supposed to be out in February. That was if my I next. I can ever get it. To, yeah, it, it's, I'm working on it right now. Okay. So I've got to get it done, and um, it's going to be Galen's Blade. Um, and then, you know, we'll, it's, it's basically going to pick up pretty much right after the events of Galen's Way. So there's not going to be much of a pause. Um, but, yeah, there, there, there'll be some uh, some interesting things going on. Just keep an eye on Cassandra. I'll just say that much. Okay. that That's good enough. Yeah, it's always hard with series because you don't want to, you know, you don't want to give too much away about it, about the first, or, the, you know, the, the books that are already out. Yeah. Cassandra's the character that surprised me because she, she, is, she was supposed to be just a minor character. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, she's kind of grown a little bit. Um, she's going to have, like I said, she's got a very interesting story arc, and I'm, I'm interested to see what the reaction is going to be as it progresses. Time for the last break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be discussing the path from journalism to space opera. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Richard Paolinelli. You've been a journalist. You've written in a lot of capacities. So um, mm-hmm. what was the impetus then? You said 2013. What what made you decide to just, just write for publication, write fiction? Well, you know, when I started back in 83, um, I, I wanted to do fiction writing. I wanted to write books. And uh, back then, it was even harder to, you know, to crack into that. And mm-hmm. I started off as just doing freelance for a couple of years. I did do, I was the lead story uh, writer for uh, a comic book series called Sea Dragon. And I, I wrote the first two issues of the six-issue run. Um, and that was in 86. Um you know, I, I had some I had some stuff I put together. I mean, I've got a book called The Marisian Factor that I finished back then, and it will never see the light of day because it's actually garbage. <laughs> it was horrible. You know, I, I, I pulled it out about 10 years ago and took a look at it. And went, oh, no, no. Now, there's a, this editing can't even save this thing. So um, I, I don't want to say I got sidetracked, but when you get offered a job that pays regular, yeah. Um, and you got a family, yeah, you, you kind of have to take that. But I never never lost that that desire to get back in and write fiction, whether it be books or, or comic books or, uh, you know, screenplay, whatever. And it just turned out, you know, it was, it was about 2010, 2011. And, you know, I was, getting to, I was getting to the point in my career where I had seen everything, I had just about done everything. 
I was getting tired of working till one in the morning, going home, and finally going to bed about three in the morning, and and missing all the all the things with family and friends. And plus, about that time, uh, the newspaper industry started really chopping jobs. Mm-hmm. And if you were someone who had been at it as long as I was, you know, you you could almost get paid twice. Uh, it would be the same amount as if they had two brand new writers coming out of school. Right. So, you know, if financially it made sense, you could dump me, you've got two people that you could bring in for the same money. So a lot, and it was happening to a lot of us. Um, so it was, it was time to move on. And I, 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 like I said, I'd done just about everything I wanted to do. And yeah, I was, I was in a bookstore and I found a book called Time Travelers Never Die by Jack McVivitt. I'd never read anything by Jack before. And I read this book and I was like, this is amazing. This is great. I've got to find out more about this guy. And I thought he was brand new. And it turns out he'd been writing science fiction for 20 years. So I go to go to get more of his books. And I'm, I'm just loving everything he does. And I read his bio. And at the age he retired from the Navy and from teaching, he was the same age as I was in 2011 when I was sitting there trying to figure out what is the next step for me. And I'm thinking, well, look, if this guy at my age can step away from his career and get into this and make it work, then I guess maybe I could too. And it's time for me to find out. So I, you know, I, I obviously talked to my wife and we were in a situation where we could we could do that, and I just took the lead and uh, you know, started working on uh, started working on the the book I wanted to go with, and I, I settled on a mystery thriller series because series were big, and that's the only thing I had that I could say I had a series for, and I got that written and it got published traditionally, and I was like, okay, this will work. Um, got the got the the entire series published traditionally, and then kind of kind of noticed I was doing all the work and getting very little of the money, and that was about when independent publishing was really taking off. So I took another leap and got into indie publishing with it. And uh, you know, to be honest with you, I am glad I made both those decisions to get back into fiction writing and to go indie because I, I'm doing things I would not have been able to do otherwise. Yeah, it sounds like the timing just really worked out nicely for you. Yeah, it did. It did. From your own experience, then, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Yeah, I mean, if if this is what you want to do, then then by all means do it. Um, understand that it's a it's a lot of work. It's it's a lot of hard work. Whether you go traditional or whether you do indie, and it's a lot harder, and it's a lot more work to go indie. I'll, I'll warn you about that. But it is rewarding if you go indie, and it is rewarding if you get traditionally published. And if it's what you want to do, then do it. And the one thing I caution is don't get trapped by the reviews you're going to get, and don't get trapped by the, the feedback you're going to get, the critique you're going to get. You need to be able to, to sort through the good and the bad, and find those nuggets that are going to make you a better writer on your next project. But I see a lot of authors who they'll get a bad review or a, a bad critique, and they're they're ready to walk away. And uh, you know, I don't I don't like seeing that. So I tell them, do not let someone tell you that you're not good enough to do this. Do it. You'll figure it out down the line. It'll, it'll come to you. You'll know, am I supposed to be doing this or not? But don't let somebody talk you out of doing something you want to do. So I, I caution against the reviews. And the story I tell in my case was back in, I want to say 1984. I had written a short story and submitted it to a magazine. And I'm not, I never mentioned any names because that's not the point of this. Um, I got a rejection letter that basically told me I had committed a great offense against the English language and I should restrict myself to flipping hamburgers. Oh that my. is a direct quote. That is a direct quote. Now, I know some some authors would give up 
that would just break them into pieces and they would never write again. Don't do that. What I did was I took that, that letter and I pinned it above my typewriter. That's how old I am. We had typewriters. We didn't have computers back then. Uh-huh. I pinned it above my typewriter and I read that letter word for word every day and then I sat down and started writing. I used it as motivation. I was like, you are not going to stop me from doing this and I am going to show you just how long you are. And, you know, I, I think uh, what, about 15, 20 years ago, I finally tossed that letter because it dawned on me. I think I've, I think I've shown I can do this. I mean, I look at my career. Um, yeah, I, I know what I'm doing and I'm good at it. And I don't need this motivation anymore. That's right. one thing I, I do I do counsel them to do is take something like that and let it motivate you. Don't let it break you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. When you take the time to read for yourself, what genres or authors do you tend to turn to? I am I am really a science fiction guy. Um I do I do have some uh mystery, you know, and, and thrillers that I'll read. Uh but for the most part, yeah, it's gonna be science fiction. My favorite author that I read now, anything he puts out I read is Jack McDivitt. Um, in fact, I got to be in an anthology with him. Uh, his story and mine were back to back, and uh, and we've exchanged emails. So it's like, you know, I, I get to be a fanboy <laughs> and, and, and chat with one of my favorite authors. Um, I, I read the anything of the Dune series that Frank Herbert um, put out, and then his son Brian and, and Kevin J. Anderson. Um, I read that. I I love the Louis L'Amour westerns. I've read all of those. Uh, you know, I'll, if it's good, I'll read it. Um, I'm I'm a co-host for a show called The Writer's Block, and we get a book every week, and we read that author's book every week, and then we talk to the author about the book. And so I've I've come across uh, some really good books lately. Um, Robert J. Sawyer had one called The Oppenheimer Alternative, which I thought was an amazing alternate history book. Uh, um, yeah. So on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Rob, I, I was wondering where he was going with it, and then when we got to the end of that one, I was like, oh, well, he, he really nailed the ending to that one. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I read a lot of different areas, but I'm, I'm at, at heart, I'm going to mostly gravitate to science fiction. Okay. Um, so you have a podcast, and you just you, you mentioned, can you mention the name of that once more? Uh, the the radio show I'm on is the Writers Block. It's on LA Talk Radio every Thursday night at six o'clock Pacific time. I have a podcast I do separately. It's on hiatus right now um, for a very strange reason. I had to have some dental surgery, and I just I don't like the way I look on camera. It's a video podcast. Okay. So in a couple of weeks, in a couple of weeks, it's going to come back and it will be fine. That's called In the Superverse Spotlight. And that would be another show altogether if I told you what Superversive was all about. Um, <laughs> but we, we, we have authors come in and, and uh, we highlight their work and we talk to them about writing. Um, and, you know, so that, that that's keeping me busy. And then obviously, you know, I'm, I, I'm on social media pretty much everywhere. Uh, we're trying to get TikTok set up, but that's another thing that I've got to wait for the, the you know my my dentist Dr Frank is trying to get done with me, um, right. so I can actually show up on camera. Uh, but yeah, if you I've got a website which is uh, www.scifiscribe.com, um, or you can just Google my name, which is you know it could be interesting to, if you get the spelling wrong. But yeah, right. I'm, I've got stuff I've got stuff everywhere, uh, real easy to find. And uh, it, it pretty much anything you need to know about what I'm up to is going to be somewhere on one of those platforms. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And, um, Richard, we've we've talked about a, a variety of different things, but is there anything that we haven't covered during our time together that you would particularly like to highlight now? Well, you know, the, the one thing I would like to highlight is that there are a lot of indie authors out there. I am one of them. Uh, our, our, we have a publishing company, Jim, Christine, and I called Tuscany Bay Books, and we have it's kind of a, a, a 
hybrid setup, we we have helped authors get their first book out under our banner. And then they have gone on and they've gone indie. Uh, we've had two or three so far that have taken what they've learned from us in that first year and then they've gone on to do other things and, and publish on their own. And we'd love to see that. So, yeah, you know, we, we keep telling them, no, we're not going to be mad at you if you break away and go do your thing. That's yeah. what we want to see. So I guess for readers out there, you know, it, I know there's a lot of indie authors out there, but there are a lot of great indie authors out there. And you know, just take the time to go through and find them. Uh, they've got some amazing, uh, just amazing stories, amazing books. Um, and and you will, I will guarantee you, you will walk away entertained by what you read. And to me, that's the that's the thing I go for when I sit down and I write is I want the reader when they're done with my book to feel like they got every penny's worth of the money they invested in my book. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, and thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thanks again for having me on. It was great. Thank you once again to Richard for joining me to talk about Galen's Way. If you're a fan of space opera, you should definitely check out this book. Not only this book, but this series. Not only this series, but this entire... There's got to be a word for this. Somebody help me out and tell me what the word is when there are... It's not really an anthology. You know what I mean. But the entire StarQuest world, StarQuest universe, because it sounds like there's going to be a lot of books and a lot of reading and for people who love those series with lots and lots and lots of books awesome and also um same world different voices so also pretty cool i think definitely check out galen's way and maybe some of the rest of the authors and series as well thank you again to richard Thank you, as always, to you. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. I hope you will join me next time when I have a returning guest coming back to the podcast. That um, guest is Susan K. Hamilton. She was on a while back to discuss, oh, a paranormal romance book that I just completely spaced on the name of. I'll have it for you next episode. <laughs> but we are here to discuss her new paranormal romance, which is The Devil Inside and has... One of the best elevator pitches, I think. It's got a really great one-liner of a tag. So I'll tell you what that is later. But paranormal romance, devils, angels, heaven, hell, that kind of stuff. Join me for that uh, as Susan comes back on the podcast to discuss her new novel. If you're a fan of this podcast, please do me the favor, the honor of giving us a review. Whether that's written or starred, either way really helps us out and I would greatly appreciate it. Also follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Ask me questions. Tell me stories. Tell me what you're reading. Hope you are having a great week so far and as always, please have that week involve lots and lots of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program